In this episode of Industrial Industries World Radio, we're taking a look at Animal Crossing. We're checking out how the game originally was created, the history of the games, fun facts, my experience playing it, and a whole lot more. So let's get to it. Go hard or go home. You are listening to Industrial Industries World Radio with your host, the ultimate party DJ, DJ Glowing Ice, for an episode of Industrial Industries World Radio. Show me what you got, DJ. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Season 2. This is Episode 22 of Industrial Industries World Radio. And I'm your host, DJ Glowing Ice. And we've got a packed show for you today. And it's a good one. We're just uh, amping up and getting ready for just four more days. And then Animal Crossing New Horizons, the new game for the Nintendo Switch, is coming out March 20th. So we just got a few more days, so I wanted to do this just to kind of hold people over, just, uh, you know, you know, kind of sharpen their claws until they get into the new Animal Crossing game. So what we're going to do is look back on the entire Animal Crossing franchise, and if those of you who haven't even played Animal Crossing have no idea what it is, you're just busy playing, uh, you know, Mario or something else and never got into the franchise. Well, I'm going to fill you in, let you know what the game is all about as well. And people who have also played the game, you may hear something that you never heard before in the game or just missed something completely. So this is going to be good for one and all. So what is Animal Crossing? Well, Animal Crossing is a game that is based in real time. So say if it's 7.22 p.m. your time... You'll turn on the game, play Animal Crossing, and in the world of Animal Crossing, it's also 7.22 p.m. You play at your own pace. It's a very relaxing game. At times, I mean, sometimes when you're fishing or you're trying to wrangle up like a shark out of the ocean or you're trying to catch a bee that fell out of a hive, you know, it could get a little hectic. But all in all, it's just a very relaxing game. You could collect furniture to put in your house pay off your house loan to upgrade and get a larger house. You know, I have a house in the latest game, New Leaf, where it's, you know, a basement. I got it upstairs. That's my bedroom. Then, you know, four rooms in the main floor. I got a kitchen, a bathroom, a study with a coffee and a coffee table. You know, and you can decorate it however you want. You get a flat screen TV, put it in there. And in some of the versions, you could actually play regular Nintendo games on. So if you want to spend your day in Animal Crossing fishing all day, catching all these fish, donating them to the town museum, and then you could go through the museum and the aquarium and see the fish you caught, you could do that. You could write nasty letters to some of the villagers and get a a response back that's like, I didn't understand what you were saying. (laughs) You could go and visit your friend's town and see how they have their town or their house decorated and set up. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. Animal Crossing is basically a life simulator. It's one of those rare games where anybody from all walks of life can get into. All ages. I've seen old 80-year-old grandmothers play it. Girls that never touched video games, never cared about video games, getting into just this game. So Animal Crossing has a wide and vast audience. People that don't even play video games love this game. So anyways, what we're going to do is go through every single game that has been released in the series. Talk about the history, who created this game in the first place, its origins, how it started. I came across a whole bunch of stuff I didn't even know about until I started really researching this. So this is new to me, and I hope it's new to you. We're going to enjoy this. But first, before we go any further... Let's take a look at past, present, future. Past, present, future. Today is March 16th and it's National Everything You Do Is Right Day. 
So spend the day knowing you can do no wrong. You do what you want and everything is all right. In the past on this day in 1621, Samoset, a Native American chief, visited the settlers of Plymouth Colony, greeting them by saying, Welcome, Englishmen. My name is Samoset. Presently, I've got a free pizza in the Domino's Rewards calling my name, and I'm ready, as the forecast calls for cloudy skies with a high of 55 in the small town region. And in the future, in March 20th, 2020, people are planning to take off school and work to play Animal Crossing New Horizons on the Nintendo Switch all day long. March 16th is the 75th day of the year, and there are 290 days left for the year 2020. Celebrity birthdays today, United States President James Madison was born on this day in 1751. Comedian Jerry Lewis was born on this day in 1926. And James E. Smith, a man who became a father at 100 years old with a woman 64 years younger than he was, was born on this day in 1849. And if it's your birthday today and you just turned 100 years old, you can go out and do whatever you want because, hey, it is national everything you do is right day. So enjoy it. Happy birthday. And this past, present, and future, it's brought to you by Sunshine Fun Time by Glowing Ice. It's my latest album full of all kinds of danceable tracks, fun lyrics, and music to get you through this last end of winter and break you into spring. It's Sunshine Fun Time by Glowing Ice, available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get music online. Industrial Industries World Radio. All right, so how we're going to dig in with Animal Crossing and get all the fossils and gyroids is this. That's a reference if you don't catch it. What we're going to do is look at the gameplay, how the game is played. Then we're going to look at the games of the series so far up to today. We've got fun facts and a few other gems later on in the show. But first, I feel like we should go all the way back to when the game was first created, when the game was birthed into the world. So let's go all the way back to its very beginnings and check out the history of Animal Crossing. So, Animal Crossing. We're going to go over the history of this entire game. we got to figure out who created the game and all that. So, Animal Crossing wouldn't be a game as a whole if it wasn't for additional directors and developers and artists and all that stuff. But Animal Crossing at its core would have never been a thing if it wasn't for one man named Katsua Eguchi. And he was born on May 15th, 1965 in Tokyo, Japan. He spent most of his childhood in a suburban area on the lower east coast of Japan, outside of Tokyo known as the Chiba Prefecture. Growing up as a kid in the 70s, Iguchi first found his love for video games in arcades around town. A bit later, he bought a PC and he got deep into computers. And as a college student, he studied computer graphics. And as he got out of college, Iguchi saw a job advertisement for Nintendo. And him being a huge fan of video games, I mean, he's going to jump in on that, you know. I think any kid growing up playing video games has that idea at some point growing up thinking, man, it would be great to make video games. I, I know I would. But uh, yeah, so anyways, he jumps at the moment to work for Nintendo. Iguchi winds up getting an interview for Nintendo, and according to Iguchi, the required exam Nintendo gave him that he had to pass to obviously, you know, get the job, it wasn't really related to video games or Nintendo products or anything about what he studied in college. But regardless, he wound up passing, giving detailed answers to all of Nintendo's questions, and now he works for Nintendo. So in 1986, great year, awesome year, 21-year-old Aguchi leaves to work for Nintendo in the city of Kyoto. 
Uh, Kyoto, it's a city more west in Japan, which is 457 kilometers or 284 miles away from Chiba, his hometown area. He was first assigned to work for promotional art for Nintendo, very general stuff. Iguchi, living in a big city away from home, he realized how lonely life can be when you leave all your friends and your family behind and... You realize only then that, you know, they play an important role in your life, just basic communication and, you know, how great it was just uh, being around friends and family. Later on in the year 1986, Nintendo, after finishing releasing Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan, known as uh, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels here in the United States, Aguchi was assigned as a level designer for the next Super Mario game they were working on, Super Mario Bros. 3. Okay, just a little side note here. Whenever I mention these years, I mention up to, say, example, 1988. Iguchi was probably working on these games before that year, but that's just the year these games are released. So, if a game is released in 1988, he might have started working on the game in 1986 and 1987, and so, we clear on that? Alright, I think we are. Okay, so in 1986 up to 1988, Aguchi works on Super Mario Bros. 3. And after Super Mario Bros. 3, we get into the Super Nintendo era. And up until 1988, Aguchi was the area director for Super Mario World. And then up to 1993, he was the director of Star Fox. And up to the middle of 1995, he was the director of what was the unreleased, now very recently released sequel to Star Fox, Star Fox 2. And after that, we're getting into the Nintendo 64 era. So up to 1996, Iguchi worked as the director for the jet ski racing game, Wave Race 64. Up to 1998, he was the chief designer for Yoshi's Story. And then in Japan in 1999, they wanted to expand on the Nintendo 64, so they released an add-on for the system known as the Nintendo 64 DD. The DD standing for disk drive, which the Nintendo 64 system would stack on top, connecting the ports underneath to play disk drive games that they were making for the system. The Nintendo 64 DD had more data storage, and it had a built-in clock, and it played games that were designed and developed as new genres of games. So with the Nintendo 64 DD, Nintendo was wanting to expand their horizons, make more different styles of video games. So keep this system in mind because it's going to come into play very soon. So up until 2000, Iguchi worked as an advisor on Mario Artist Talent Maker for the Nintendo 64 DD. So after that, Aguchi started working on this game. Serving as co-director, he started to create an RPG-style game with dungeons, bosses, and monsters, and it'd be multiplayer so uh, people could help out. And there'd be animals in this game that would be enlisted by the player to help them. And to get these animals to help, you know, it'd be focused on cooperation and communication. So you could only enlist certain animals in this world if they were up at this certain time when you were playing in the real world. And how this would be all tracked would be the utilization of the internal clock inside the Nintendo 64 disk drive. So as this game kept being developed for the Nintendo disk drive, and people were realizing that the disk drive was a kind of a commercial flop. It never made it outside of Japan, and sold roughly about 15,000 systems. So Nintendo looked at this game that Aguchi was working on, which was called Dobutsu no Mori, or Animal Forest in English, and they decided to put it in a regular Nintendo 64 cartridge instead. So now this game, Animal Forest, uh, it's being downgraded from a disk drive game to a cartridge. So much of the memory space that it was relying on, now gone, you know, the whole game had to be redesigned. So all the RPG elements in the game, such as the dungeons and the bosses, everything was scrapped. So the only things left in this game now were, 
you lived in a town as a human with animals living amongst you and you communicated with them and you played on a real time clock and that's how the game operated. So those were the only two things that were basically left. So now the team working on the game, they had to find a whole new way to package this game and make it work and make it fun. So the team decided to make this game an open-ended and addicting style of game instead of a goal-oriented one like it was originally. So they filled this game with all different kinds of things you could do. Larger things to complete, smaller little things to complete. To make it more of a well-rounded game where there's something for everybody, all different kinds of game players. So as this game Animal Forest was being developed over this whole span of time, Aguchi wanted to recreate the feelings of loneliness he had when he moved away from home 15 years ago to work for Nintendo. So he based Animal Forest on three things. Family, friendship, and community. Such as receiving letters from your mom, getting a new job, starting out with nothing in your house and then filling it with your types of furniture, whatever you want to get, items you collect along the way. So that's where a lot of these elements in the game were inspired from. And so now Aguchi with a family of his own, wife, kids, the family part of Animal Crossing was based on how his family all played video games, from his wife to his kids, but it was always at different times of the day. So he thought it'd be nice that there could be a game that people could play together, but not at the same time. You know, sharing things, a game kids would play after school, and a game he could play when he'd get home at night. A game where there was a nice, peaceful, enjoyable space where all people in his family could interact with each other throughout different times of the day. So now this comes to 2001 where the first version of Animal Crossing is released in Japan on the Nintendo 64. Animal Forest was released in Japan on April 14th, 2001, and it's the only Nintendo 64 game to feature an internal clock inside of the cartridge. The box art was made up to look like a postcard with stamps, and the game is described on the box as communication game. So with the help of the team behind him, Aguchi also had help from female developers that gave it a female touch with uh, a lot of the clothes being designed and the furniture being designed. So this female touch gave the game a much wider appeal. So even though the Nintendo 64 was becoming obsolete, Animal Forest in its first week sold 30,000 copies. And then after that, through good reviews and word of mouth and everybody enjoying the game initially, they went on to sell 213,000 copies for the Nintendo 64. Animal Forest became so popular that they literally sold out of cartridges and they just couldn't meet the demand. Nintendo seeing this as a very good problem, the GameCube was being released literally five months after Animal Forest released for the Nintendo 64. So they thought, let's just take this game and port it to the GameCube. And since the Nintendo GameCube had an internal clock inside the system, it was a perfect game to be able to utilize that function. Now, there was talks about porting the game over just as it was as a Nintendo 64 game, but they wound up saying, no, let's... Uh, Let's use the GameCube's power. Let's put in some extra content. Let's do some uh, Game Boy Advance connectivity with it and uh, see what we could do. Later on that year, October 2001, a page on Nintendo's website noted that Animal Forest was being optimized for its US debut on the GameCube. And at this time behind the scenes, uh, a lot of the items in the game were already getting started to be translated for English. So now, roughly eight months after the Nintendo 64 version of Animal Forest, December 14th, 2001, Dobutsu no Mori Plus, or Animal Forest Plus, was released for the GameCube in Japan, which included a 59-block memory card for people to save their town's data onto. Like I said, the game utilized the GameCube's internal clock, which made time pass in the game even when you weren't playing it. So that's what led to its slogan, 
It's playing even when you're not. Animal Forest Plus for the GameCube sold more than 92,000 copies in its first week. In early 2002, the American and European version of Animal Forest was now announced to be renamed Animal Crossing. And while they're working on localization to fit the American and European audience, it took a really, really long time. So the Japanese holidays in the game had to be removed because it would never mean anything to anybody in other regions. So a lot of the holidays, conversations, animals talking about the holidays and the events, they all had to be taken out and replaced with things Americans and Europeans would like and relate to. So during this time, the localization team giving replacements of cultural references had to make brand new holidays and brand new items. So after a span of 8 to 12 months, translating over 30,000 files of texts, creating new items, and adding support to the new Nintendo e-reader that connected to the Game Boy Advance, September 16th, 2002, Animal Crossing was released in North America. And right off the bat, it was met with great reviews and success, winning rewards and nominations from Game of the Year to winning Best Role-Playing Game on the GameCube. It had lots of positive praises from its unique gameplay and its very long lifespan, but also some people took digs at it, saying that the graphics were outdated. Well, obviously, because this game was basically a literal port from a Nintendo 64 game just with a lot of extra stuff. So yeah, it kind of came with the territory, but still, a lot of people overlooked that just because the game was so fun to play. So with the great job Nintendo of America's localization team did, Nintendo in Japan retranslated Animal Crossing back into Japanese with even more extra content. So this came an even newer version of Animal Crossing called Dobutsu no Mori E Plus or Animal Forest E Plus in Japan. And it was released in Japan on June 27th, 2003. And looking at the fact that the e-reader really wasn't a success outside of Japan, this version of Animal Forest or Animal Crossing uh, never made it outside of Japan. Now in 2004 though, Animal Crossing 2 was said to be released, but it never made it. It became an unreleased game, and there's only a few screenshots of the game out there, so if you want to search that, it's, it's kind of neat to check out. But Nintendo, seeing as they were working on a new handheld system called the Nintendo DS, they decided to stop on Animal Crossing 2 and start working on a title for Animal Crossing on the Nintendo DS. And this wound up being Animal Crossing Wild World. So in May 2004 at E3, Animal Crossing DS was announced. And in order to make localization easier, some events in the original Animal Crossing were taken out, and Aguchi served as producer for Animal Crossing Wild World for this system, the Nintendo DS, which was a portable double-screen handheld system. And on November 23rd, 2005, Animal Crossing Wild World was released in Japan, and in its first week, it sold 325,000 copies and it was released in North America December 5th, Australia December 8th, and in Europe March 31st, 2006. So getting out of the GameCube era, 2006 is the year of the Nintendo Wii. And Aguchi worked as a producer for Wii Sports, Wii Play, and as a supervisor for Star Fox Command on the DS. So, this isn't a game, but it's notable. You know, it's notable. December 16, 2006, with the huge success of Animal Crossing Wild World, Animal Forest, the movie, was released exclusively in Japan with the story of a movie based around Animal Crossing Wild World. Up until 2008, Iguchi served as producer for Wii Music, and the later end of 2008, the Wii version of Animal Crossing came out, Animal Crossing City Folk, 
and it was released in all regions over a two to three week span, besides Korea, for which that region, it came out in January 2010. And like Animal Crossing for the GameCube and Animal Crossing Wild World, Animal Crossing City Folk was still basically the same game, just with added features and content, smoother graphics, along with being able to connect your DS with Wild World into it, and you could transfer over characters and all kinds of stuff. Within a month, City Folk sold 949,000 copies in Japan, and six months later, City Folk sold 3.38 million copies worldwide. Up until 2009, Aguchi worked as a producer for the sequel to Wii Sports called Wii Sports Resort. And June 2010, Animal Crossing New Leaf was announced at E3. And now we're getting into Nintendo's next console after the Wii, which was the Wii U. And up until 2012, Eguchi served as producer for the hardware of the Wii U, along with the game for the new system called Nintendo Land. Late 2012, as Eguchi working as producer, Nintendo released Animal Crossing New Leaf for the latest version of the Nintendo's handheld system, the Nintendo 3DS. So as New Leaf was released in Japan in 2012, North America and Europe saw releases of New Leaf in June 2013. New Leaf went on to become basically the essential Animal Crossing, the ultimate one. And it went on to become the best rated game too in the series, with sales checking in after about 6 years of 12.45 million copies. Up until 2015, Aguchi worked as producer on Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D and Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes for the 3DS and Splatoon for the Wii U. July 2015, with none of Aguchi's input, an Animal Crossing title called Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer was released in Japan. This was the first game in the series where it was a side game where the game was like uh, level based somewhat and it focused on decorating characters homes and yards. It was one of two games that would want to focus on using amiibo toy figurines that players could scan to interact with the game. And within the next year Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer sold over 3 million copies despite its mixed and average reviews. November 15th came the sister game of Happy Home Designer, titled Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival for the Wii U, which it was a game that also interacted with Amiibo figurines, and it was a board game that was on the screen and mini games along with it, much like Mario Party, but it wasn't as successful. Director of the game Aya Kiyo Goku said, honestly, we just wanted Animal Crossing Amiibo. So that's why we made a game that works with them. Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival sold a little over 20,000 copies within its first week of release in Japan. So seeing now that Animal Crossing Amiibo was a thing now, in July 2016 it was announced that Animal Crossing New Leaf would get an update that included Amiibo compatibility and extra content such as villagers, furniture, and areas, and this was called Animal Crossing New Leaf Welcome Amiibo. Players with the original New Leaf game got the update for free via the internet, but also Animal Crossing New Leaf Welcome Amiibo was released as a standalone game as well. November 2017, Nintendo wanting to crack into the mobile game market threw Animal Crossing's name into the mix with the first Animal Crossing mobile game, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, it is released on iOS and Android, and the game is mostly about staying around and decorating a campsite. You know, there are other locations and things to explore as well. So now it's 2017, and we are in the Nintendo Switch era. And September 13th, 2018, big announcement. During a Nintendo Direct, it was announced that a new Animal Crossing game was being made for the Nintendo Switch. But before we get into that, let's recap on our good friend Katsuya Iguchi. What was he up to while these Animal Crossing side games were being put out? Well, 
Up until 2016, Eguchi was the senior producer for the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD remake on the Wii U. And he also served as general producer for Tank Troopers on the 3DS. 2017, Eguchi worked as general producer for ARMS and Splatoon 2 for the Nintendo Switch. 2018, Aguchi was producer for Starlink Battle for Atlas for the Nintendo Switch. And in 2019, Aguchi was project management for Luigi's Mansion 3 and also served as producer for the game The Stretchers, both on the Nintendo Switch. And now it's 2019 and people are waiting. Hey, where's the Animal Crossing for Nintendo Switch at? You said 2019. So as people were wondering where this game was at, Nintendo came out and they apologized, but they said, To ensure the game is the best it can be, we must ask that you wait a little longer than we thought. And the reasoning behind this, behind the scenes, was that Nintendo wanted to avoid crunch to give their employees uh, healthy work and life balance. And so now, it's the year 2020. And March 20th, 2020. Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Nintendo Switch is released and instead of the player coming to a town that's built up already, the player's coming to a deserted island. And this was intended on purpose so the player has an infinite amount of freedom. They can make the island exactly how they want it. They can form whatever they want, build things, put things wherever they want, and go above and beyond. With the Gucci serving as producer in this latest edition of Animal Crossing, it just proves that Animal Crossing is alive and well, and the best is yet to come. Alright guys, so you know how the history of Animal Crossing went now, so let's check out how this game is actually played. And where we're starting with this is what I'm familiar with, which is Animal Crossing on the GameCube. The one that was released in North America. Sorry, I don't speak Japanese. I wish I could, but yeah, I don't. So I'm going to describe this first version of Animal Crossing, and this will basically be the base for every other game later on in the series to talk about. So just know this is basically how all of the Animal Crossing games are played. Okay, so your first time playing Animal Crossing, you're going to be on a train, and this blue cat is going to sit right across from you and start making small talk, chatting, asking what your name is, asking the town that you're going to, which you get the name, the town, wherever you're heading to. And he's going to ask you all these other different questions about if you're a boy, if you're a girl. From the different answers you choose, uh, that kind of determines how your face is going to look like and the characteristics, because there's different shapes of eyes and noses and all kinds of things. So from these answers that you give when talking to Rover in the train, it's going to determine how you look once you get off at the town you're moving into. So anyways, Rover's going to ask you your situation, you know, where you're moving to, do you have a place to stay, and you're going to have to say, uh, uh, I don't know, and he's going to be shocked. So he's going to pull a few strings. He's going to go in the back, and he's going to call up on his phone, and he calls up this guy named Tom Nook. Now, Tom Nook, he is a tanuki, and he runs the shop. So Rover calls him and hangs up the phone, gets back to you, and he says, Oh, I made a call. Just uh, whenever you get off the train, uh, Tom Nook, my friend Tom, he's going to be meeting you at the station, and he'll show you around, show you uh, a place where you could stay. So you get off at the station, and Tom Nook is there. He comes up to you, and uh, he brings you to your house. And your house is this little ramshackle 
one room, tiny little place. It's just enough to maybe put a bed and a few other things, and that's about it. Very tiny. And then Tom Nook is going to tell you, oh, you could pay this off whenever you feel like it, but this house is going to cost you sixteen or 15,000 bells, which bells are the currency in Animal Crossing. And I should say right now, any animal talking to you is going to speak in this gibberish kind of language. But you could still kind of make out that it is saying the words that it's speaking, but it's in a just a weird... Very high-pitched kind of thing. And uh, it's called animalese. That's what the language is called. So we've got bells as the currency and animalese as the language that these animals talk to you through. So got that established? All right. Okay. So after Tom Nook tells you that you owe him this much to pay off your debt, you could take your time to pay it off. But I always wanted to pay it off just because it's fun to sell things, get the money and all that. So just through having fun selling things, finding seashells by the seashore on the beach, or shaking trees to get fruit out of it, and then sell the fruit to Tom Nook, and he'll give you the money to pay off your debt. You know, just through that, it's a fun little goal to achieve. Among every other thing that you could do in this game, uh, that's one of the things I enjoy doing the most, is paying off the debt, and then you get a choice to upgrade your house to the next thing. So anyways, Tom Nook tells you how much you owe. He advises that you meet him at the shop so you could work for him to pay off the debt a little bit. So this is like the tutorial phase of the game. So you go to Tom Nook's cranny. It's his little shop. That's what it's called. And, you know, he gives you an outfit to wear with a little hat with a leaf design on it. So now I got to explain something. Tom Nook is a tanuki. That's how he kind of got his name, Tom Nook Tanuki. Tanukis have this legend about them in Japan to where they have the ability to turn leaves into money. So that's why the leaf is such a huge uh, thing in Animal Crossing. It's the logo for Tom Nook's shops. Uh, whenever you buy furniture from him, the furniture in his shop turns into a leaf when you put it in your pocket. And then when you go to your house and you throw, say you bought a bed from Tom Nook, into your house, it turns from a leaf into a bed as it hits the floor. Um, so that is the whole deal behind these leaves in Animal Crossing. And so Tom Nook's first going to tell you to, you know, plant some flowers outside the shop and then plant some trees here and there. And then he's going to tell you to run some errands, deliver some packages to some of the villagers in town. And so one of the last jobs he has you do is to Go out and introduce yourself to everybody in town, just so you get acquainted with everybody, and uh, boom, you know, you're kind of done with the tutorial. And so now, after Tom Nook sets you free, you are now free to go about the village and do whatever you please. And there's so much to do in the village, like, you will get lost in this game, trying out one thing, pursuing another thing. The list goes on and on and on. But first, let's talk about how you're viewing the village as a player. So you're going to be looking at your character from a top-down kind of perspective, but at an angle to where you could see behind your character too to just see the horizons of the sky. So, you know, you're above your character. And the town itself in the GameCube version of Animal Crossing was broken up into acres, and there was 30 acres altogether. So there was one, two, three, four, five across, and then A, B, C, D, E, F going down. And whenever you'd run to the very edge of one acre, the camera would pan over whichever direction you were going. If you were going down, the camera would pan down, and so on and so forth. This changed later on in the series to where Wild World, you know, the uh, map was just kind of like a scrolling thing, to where now it's like almost you're on this like... I don't want to say globe, but it just scrolls along with you. So they kind of gave away with the idea of the block by block thing uh, early on. And within these acres, there would be buildings, ponds, a river that would run through the entire town, a beach at the bottom of the area with a dock that would take you to an island. Some acres would just have nothing but trees, and some would have 
uh, villagers' houses there. So it all depends. And whenever you walk into any of these villagers' houses, they had their own little personality within how their house is decorated so it was kind of cool to check out their houses how they had their table set up or a tv put in there or no tv or what kind of music they have playing in their house you know every single animal has its own little quirk so while we're on the subject of the neighbors in your town let's check out what you could do and communicate with them about so whenever you come across an animal or a villager in your town and you talk to them, you could still tell it kept some of those original RPG elements because you have a choice of things to answer back to them whenever they talk. And they always have their own special way and speech of how they talk, little sayings that they only say, kind of like a signature at the end of an email, you know, they kind of, you know, they kind of have their own thing. So there's eight different personalities there's four personalities for a female and there's four personalities for a male. So if there's a male animal, there's four different personality types it could have. There's a cranky or a jock or a lazy or a smug personality. And then if you come across a female villager, there's four different types of personalities they could have, which is normal, peppy, snooty, or uchi. Which is kind of like the big sister personality that's kind of like cranky, you know, blunt. Those are the different kinds of personalities that these animals have. So they're not just some basic, just uh, void, blank animals and they say all the same things. No, they all have different things and quirks about them. And so whenever you approach and talk to them, there's a, a menu that'll pop up and you can either choose to help them out if that option's available or you could just talk to them and talking to them could turn into a whole different thing where you might end up trading some things that you have for something that they have or and then the third option is to just uh, cancel the conversation altogether. But if that first option is available, that first top third option, that's usually asking to do a favor for them. And this will mostly consist of have you deliver something to another villager in town. So that becomes like almost a mini game in itself where, okay, oh, I need to take this uh, Christmas tree t-shirt to Polly. And so you'll need to find Polly. So first things first, you'll go to Polly's house. And if she's not there, then you're like, oh, no, here we go. We have to look throughout the entire village now and try to find where Polly is. One thing you could also do with the villagers is if you have a bug net, you could always hit them and uh, <laughs> it'll hurt them. And then uh, you hit them enough times, they'll get mad and uh, yell at you. So that's always fun to do. All right. So we're going to be looking now at the locations in your Animal Crossing town and uh, the animals, the characters that uh, frequent or own these businesses and uh, hang out in them. So let's start at square one with the house. You got your brand new house, and it's a tiny little shack, just a one little room. But you could upgrade it to the point where you have one big main room, and then you got four rooms in your main level. Then you got an upstairs that you could upgrade and make it larger. And then you also got a basement. And then in New Leaf as well, you could have a storage area that you could just put all your items in. You got your house. And in the original game, I don't know if it's like this with the other games, but once you pay off all of that and you can't upgrade your house anymore, you wind up getting a statue in town. So then you walk out of your house and you got this little wooden fire hydrant thing spinning around. And this is where you save the game in the original Animal Crossing and you could also set it up to leave messages for other players to check out and all that. And then to the other side, you got a red mailbox with a blue little flag whenever you got mail and it beeps at you, sometimes from your mama, you know? So that is your home. And with your home in the original Animal Crossing, it's connected to this whole kind of plaza area where there's three other houses where other players, you know, say you got three brothers, you know, each brother that plays this Animal Crossing game has their own house and they could customize it however they want. So let's go to the place where your journey in this town started. It's the train station. And this is where you could use to travel to a friend's town as long as you have their memory card uh, in slot two of the GameCube. And this is also where KK Slider plays every Saturday night. 
So you could always go up there, have him play you a live song, and then he'll give you the air check of the certain song he played for you that night, and you could, you know, play that on your radio at home. And at this train station, there's a little monkey. There's a monkey that works the train station, and his name's Porter. And so, yeah, Porter's always standing there by that train station. Rain, sleet, snow, or shine, he's there to help you get about your travels. And then we got Tom Nook's store, where you can buy all kinds of things, from furniture to tools, like shovels and axes to chop down trees. And every single time you pay off your debt and you upgrade your house, his shop also upgrades. So it starts from a shack to almost a whole huge uh, retail shop. So Tom Nook grows with you. Then we got the police station, and the police dogs there are Copper and Booker. They run it. It serves as an information center, and it's a place for lost and found items. So if you lose something in town, chances are the next day or the day after, it winds up in that lost and found. And Booker, inside the station, he's not too smart. So you could go up and find things that aren't yours in the lost and found and take it, and Booker's completely fine with it. So that's a good way to get some uh, items that you don't have or some items that you need. Uh, Next up, we got the post office, and this is where the Pelicans Pelly, Phyllis, and Pete are and work. And the post office is where you go when you want to obviously mail a letter, and this is where you go to also pay off your debt to Tom Nook. Then if you want to check the healthiness of your town, you know, how it's going, if there's weeds that need to be pulled, this is when you go to the wishing well. And if you keep your town in tip-top shape for two weeks straight, you wind up getting the Golden Axe. And the Golden Axe never breaks, so you can chop down as many trees as you want, and you never have to worry about the axe head breaking. So that's pretty awesome. And the Wishing Well is basically the meeting place also when uh, special events happen in your town. This location is probably my favorite. It's the Garbage Dump. And this is the place where you can put all your items that you just want to throw away. And it's emptied twice a week, every Monday and Thursday at 6 a.m. And it's always good to go to the dump to pick up some items. Sometimes you find some furniture in there that's uh, really awesome. Then if you're feeling fashionable and you want to get uh, some outfits or make your own outfits, we could go to the town tailors, the Able sisters. They're Sable and Mabel, who are sisters, and uh, they're hedgehogs. And so, yeah, this is where you design patterns, whatever you want to do. You could set it as your wallpaper, you could set it as your hat, set it as a t-shirt, your carpet flooring. Whatever you want to do, you could do it at the Able Sisters. Then there's a special little thing you could do during the winter time at the lighthouse. So, most of the time during the year, the lighthouse is run by Tortimer, but during the winter, he'll go on vacation and he'll ask you to watch over it. So if you do a good job during Tortimer's week-long vacation, you'll get a box of chocolates and a lighthouse model you could put in your basement and have a whole model of your town. Then you got the melody board. It's right outside the post office. And you could set the melody board with music notes to be the town's song. It could be set to whatever song or whatever jambled mess you ever wanted to compose on this melody board. And then next, if you want to go on vacation, there's the dock by the beach. But uh, in order to get off the dock and head to the special island in the GameCube version, at least, you have to have a Game Boy Advance connected to the GameCube with a special cable. That'll take you to the island. You can get all kind of special items that uh, you just can't get in the mainland. So that's about all the main locations in the game. So now let's take a look at what we could do inside the game, actually. So... Throughout the game, you know, it's based on real time, so there's four seasons, winter, when it snows, spring, summer, and then fall. And you can wear outfits, help run errands for people, uh, collect insects, fish, you could dig up fossils, chop down trees. And whenever you buy a fishing pole from Tom Nook, you could fish in ponds, rivers, the beach. And you can pick up all different kinds of various species of fish from all different areas. Some fish you could only catch in a pond, some you could only catch in the ocean. And there's a list, a little checklist, you could get all of them and donate them to the museum. 
And whenever you go to the museum and donate these fish, you know, the museum starts out with nothing in its aquariums. And as you donate more, obviously, the aquariums fill up. So you could always stop by there and check out all that you donated. See the fish swim around everywhere or the insects or the fossils. So you go into the fossil area and see skeletons of dinosaurs. And when it comes to fruit, whenever you start your town, your town has one native fruit. And you have to travel to other people's towns because they'll have a different fruit than yours. Like mine, I originally started out with peaches and I had an extra memory card. So I started another file on this other memory card. And this other town that I started had oranges. So I just went over there and that's how I wound up, uh, you know, getting a bunch of different fruit. I would just uh, keep deleting one town and... Uh, more of these exotic fruits than your native fruit in your town that you start out with, they sell for a whole lot more. So I would just plant orchards and orchards of these foreign fruits that weren't part of my town originally and just make bank. So I mentioned this before, but you could write letters to villagers. Uh, you could pull weeds. You could run and hit all the rocks in town. And the one rock that always throws out money bags at you for a short amount of time, you hit it, it'll turn red, and you just got to keep repeatedly hitting it. And it'll keep bouncing out bags of money until uh, it finally just fades back to a gray color of a rock. And uh, that happens one time per day. So find that money rock, and that's how you can make some money that way. So uh, find that money rock and just keep hitting it with your shovel, and you'll be good to go. And like I said before, you could go to the town dump and grab everything out of the dump and just sell it to Tom Nook for a little bit of cash. Get a bug net, catch the bugs. You could hunt for fossils. So let, let me tell you about the fossils. Every day at 6 a.m., five fossils pop up in town. And how you find the fossils are these like little star-shaped uh, weeds that you have to just find in the ground. And you dig them up and just uh, keep donating them to the museum. Or you could sell them to Tom Nook or just set it in your house. And you could walk in and have a Triceratops uh, skeleton in your house. So, And when catching bugs, I just want to say sometimes when you shake a tree, a beehive will fall from it. And this swarm of bees will chase after you. If you don't get into a building or turn around and be brave to try to catch one with a bug net, you will get stung. And then you'll need medicine to uh, clear that up. Or after a couple days, it will go away. But still, yeah, your, one of your eyes will just swell shut. So another thing you could do daily is go and look for a glowing golden spot coming from the ground. And if you dig up where this spot is, you'll get a thousand bells in this bag. Now the trick is, you could either take that thousand bells and just put it in your bank, or you could bury the thousand bells and it'll grow into a tree. And once this tree has matured into a money tree, uh, three bags of uh, money will grow on the tree and you could shake them out and you make a lot more money than just taking the bag out of the ground and banking it. So that's always another thing. You could also take the money and bury a shovel in this glowing hole. And that will start another tree to the point where if you let that tree grow up, it'll grow a golden shovel that will never break. So now this is the very first game and it was jam packed with stuff already. Stuff that keeps you busy, but it's low stress, fun things to do at your leisure. And since this game goes on in real time, there are actual holidays that go on, just like holidays in your real life and your birthday, they celebrate a birthday, you get a cake and all that kind of stuff. So let's go month by month now and see what kind of holidays are in Animal Crossing that uh, you could join in on. The festivities, there's always something happening. So in January, we've got New Year's Day. February, we got Groundhog Day. March is Spring Sports Fair. In April, we've got April Fool's Day, Cherry Blossom Festival, and Nature Day. May, we've got spring cleaning and Mother's Day. In June, we've got the summer fishing tourney. That's every Sunday in the month of June. Then we got graduation day and Father's Day. July is your hometown day, which is just a random day in July. And if you're not sure what your hometown day is July, it's uh, noted in your diary inside your house. And then we got the fireworks show for the 4th of July and morning aerobics. 
July 25th through August 31st from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Copper, he's in charge of doing that. August, we've got the Meteor Shower and Founders Day. September, we've got Labor Day, Harvest Moon, and Fall Sports Fair. October, we've got Explorers Day, Mushroom Season from the 15th through the 25th. November, we've got the Fall Fishing Tourney every Sunday in November. Mayor's Day, Officer's Day, and the Harvest Festival, which is basically Thanksgiving. And then the day after the Harvest Festival, we have Sale Day, appropriately celebrating Black Friday. Then in December, to close out the year, we've got Snow Day, Toy Day, Jingle the Reindeer visits on the 24th. And then at the end of the year, we have the New Year's Eve countdown, followed by fireworks. And events in Animal Crossing aren't just uh, limited to holidays. You know, throughout the average week, you could go every Saturday to the train station and see K.K. Slider play his guitar, request songs. He'll be sitting on his little wooden box playing away. And then on random days, you'll meet Gracie the giraffe. She's like a fashion designer, and she'll have a car And she'll give you the option, you know, if you want to wash the car. And if you do a good job by tapping A really fast, she may give you one of her special designer t-shirts. And then there is Red, who set up his tent. And he runs the black market where you can buy rare paintings and goods. But you got to watch out because Red has a lot of counterfeit stuff he sells to you. And last but not least, as if the game isn't great enough, this was the cherry on top. What I mean by this, there were Nintendo games. I've mentioned this before, but there were Nintendo games inside of this game, which was just like a collection of the greatest hits of all the regular Nintendo Entertainment System games, the NES games. So these were kind of hard to get, though. There were some titles you could only get if you visited the island and got it from there, or you had to say a special code to Tom Nook that I usually found online, and then, you know, you would get the game and all that. So I got a lot of them through telling Tom Nook a code and getting them that way. And some were available through giveaways on Nintendo's website and all that, but uh, let's go through this list of all the NES games that were in Animal Crossing. So in Japan, there were two exclusive games just for Japan, which were Gomuku Narabe Renju, which is like a tabletop kind of dot game. I don't know, I've watched it online, I I didn't really understand it, but there was that, and then there was Mahjong. And outside of Japan, in Animal Crossing, if you were lucky, you were able to get The Legend of Zelda, Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, Balloon Fight, Baseball, Clue Clue Land, Clue Clue Land D, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong Jr. Math, Donkey Kong 3, Excite Bike, Golf, Pinball, Punch Out, Soccer, Tennis, and Wario's Woods. But I just want to say in the North American version, getting Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, or The Legend of Zelda, um, I still wasn't able to get them. But I know it's available and you're able to somehow. I just don't know. How, but throughout the game, you're able to get all those other games fairly easily if you look at the right codes and uh, finagle your way in there. So, yeah, I can't tell you how much time I spent playing two player Wario's Woods with my buddy Jake in Animal Crossing. Go down to your basement, let's play Wario's Woods. Set up Wario's Woods, you can play two player on there, and yeah, man, those were some good times. So that about closes up the gameplay. There's a whole lot more you could do in that game, but just trying to summarize it all the best I can, the quickest way I can, (laughs) without sounding redundant, uh, that's that. So now we're going to check out the series of games and see how they improved over time. So let's check it out. So, going all the way back to the Nintendo 64 version of Animal Crossing, or uh, I should say, 
Animal Forest. Okay, calm down, guys. Calm down. It was released April 14th, 2001 and sold over 213,000 copies before Nintendo ran out of stock and then they just decided to port it to the GameCube. But with additions, of course. So, looking at this original one from N64, the differences in this game compared to Animal Crossing or Animal Forest Plus is like characters, some did not exist, things in general, places. It's crazy to think that these things didn't exist, but here's the list. Tortimer, the Able Sisters and their shop, the museum, along with Blathers, but fossils could still be sent to the Faraway Museum for identification, so there was that at least. Uh, the dock and Cap'n didn't exist. The island and all of its islanders didn't exist. Uh, the house the player begins the game with only contains a tape deck, so there wasn't a little wooden box with a diary on it. And uh, the player's house is comprised of only a single room, and the second floor and basement expansions are introduced with Animal Forest Plus and Animal Crossing. So, man, yeah, that was it's kind of a lame, uh, lame entry in Animal Crossing, but it was the first one. Also, the Wishing Well was a bell shrine instead, taking its place. The Sea Bass, Red Snapper, Barred Knife Jaw, Jellyfish, Arapaima, Crawfish, Frog, and Killifish are all absent from the game. The player's not able to run. And traveling to other towns consisted of using the controller memory packs inside the Nintendo 64 controllers. The voices of the animals in this version were in a higher pitch, and the keyboard system for this game was in a dial setting and you used the Nintendo 64 controller stick to choose your letters that way. And during the wintertime, igloos contained walks with tofu, which in Animal Crossing they were replaced with cauldrons of chowder, which look really good. So that's what the first Animal Crossing game, Dobutsu no Mori Animal Forest, it was all about Animal Forest Plus, released in Japan on December 14th, 2001, and Animal Crossing, released in North America September 16th, 2002, both on the Nintendo GameCube. And altogether, Animal Crossing sold 2.32 million copies. And the differences between Animal Forest Plus and Animal Crossing which characters were redesigned in Animal Crossing to have a less distinctly Japanese appearance. And there were a lot of differences between the availability of NES games between the Japanese version and the uh, North American version. An Ice Climber was a housewarming gift. After transferring uh, your data from the original Nintendo 64 game to the GameCube using a service. So that's the way you got Ice Climber. In Animal Crossing, you were only able to get it through an E-Series card. In Animal Force Plus, you could get Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda through a uniquely generated secret code. As in Animal Crossing over here in North America, you are only able to get it through either an E-Card or just some weird way. I don't even know how. And you were able to get Super Mario Brothers for Animal Forest Plus by Famitsu Magazine during a sweepstakes. And uh, it's not legitimately obtainable in Animal Crossing. So you gotta do some hacking. Uh, moving on from that, we've got the Japan-only title, the Dobutsu no Mori E+. Plus, released June 27th, 2003 for the Nintendo GameCube. The differences between Animal Crossing and Animal Forest E+. Plus, you no longer run out of ink when writing letters or posts on the bulletin board. That's removed completely. Tom Nook can be woken up after hours by hitting the shop door three times with a shovel. Nook will be in his pajamas and allow the player to shop, but he will move a lot more slowly and sale prices are inflated by 40% and he will buy items for 20% less and the catalog is unavailable. And if the store has been upgraded to Nookington's, Timmy and Tommy will also appear in their pajamas after hours. Tom Nook sells party poppers in the latter half of December in anticipation of New Year's Eve. He also offers a greater variety of items during his sales, such as party poppers, fans, balloons, and pinwheels. 
The Reset Monitoring Center can be accessed after encountering Mr. Rossetti twice. Once a week, a random rock around town will become the entrance to the center, and it can be broken with a shovel. Mr. Rossetti and Don Rossetti can be found here. You can hang out there. Animal Island is no longer accessed by connecting a Game Boy Advance to the Nintendo GameCube, which instead, each player must now first purchase their own private island from Tom Nook. And this is only after paying all of the house upgrade loans that you could do this. And the island starts out without any inhabitants, but you could have people move there by scanning e-cards. And that makes them wash ashore, so the player can revive them, and then they'll make a small little bungalow on the island. The player can now eavesdrop on conversations held between two villagers. Villagers can become ill and require to be given medicine to treat their illness. Flowers can now be picked up and held in the player's hand. There's eight new insects in this game and eight new fish. K.K. Slider will stage a live performance to celebrate the player's birthday, and Town's villagers will attend and celebrate with them. Three new songs are available from K.K. Slider, My Place, To The Edge, and Forest Life. So moving forward now to the next one, we've got Animal Crossing Wild World, released in Japan on November 23rd, 2005. It was released in North America on December 5th, 2005, and in Europe, March 31st, 2006, for the Nintendo DS. It sold 11.75 million copies worldwide and is seen as a pretty big success. So it was the first Animal Crossing flagship title to be on a portable system, and the new additions for this game, the tools. We got a slingshot, a watering can, and a timer. We got new holidays, such as Yay Day and Lottie Day. It was more customizable than the original, with the ability for the player to change their hat, their facial accessories, and their hairstyle. There were new characters like Celeste, the Observatory Owl, Brewster, the Barman, and Harriet, the Salon Hairstylist. The museum holds larger collections and now also has an observatory and a cafe. Animal villagers will sometimes give you their pictures, so you don't forget them. And they're a lot more interactive. So these villagers, they'll chase people that they want to talk to, challenge players to fishing or bud catching matches, uh, come to the player's house for a chat, and tend to their own gardens now. And at 8 p.m. each Saturday, K.K. Slider plays songs at the cafe now, also, some new songs were added, like Marine Song 2001. There are 16 new fish, as well as 16 new bugs to catch. And the changes to this game, also, the acre map system is now gone. Some characters from the original Animal Crossing, such as Porter, the monkey from the train station, have been removed. The police station and post office buildings have been removed from town, but the town gate and town hall replace them. The wishing well is gone, the town dump is gone, but the recycle bin at town hall replaces the dump. And Don Rossetti does not appear at all. The collectible NES games that you could play are all removed. Bomber. And Tom Nook sells only one house, not four houses like the original one but up to four human players can live in the same house. And the journal feature where it was possible to write a public or private journal entry each month, that's now gone. And this is the first game that allows wireless connection to visit other towns. So that's Wild World. Looking at Animal Crossing City Folk, it was released in late 2008 worldwide for the Nintendo Wii, and it sold 4.32 million copies worldwide. Europe and Australia, it's known as Animal Crossing Let's Go to the City, not City Folk. So just a little variation there. So the biggest and newest difference between this title and the previous titles were the city. So there was all kinds of shops in this city. So we're just going to go through here. We've got Crazy Reds, which is the black market shop where you can buy rare items and paintings that could be fake at times. We've got the Marquee, and it's the city's theater where comedy routines by Dr. Shrunk are performed. 
the Happy Room Academy, which is managed by Lyle the Blue Otter, where you can check your Happy Room score. You can check out a model room in the back as to how you should be decorating your room, according to them at least. We've got Gracie Grace, the giraffe fashionista. It's uh, her high-end boutique shop that she has, and she sells furniture, clothes, and accessories. And sometimes she'll appear to give you a fashion critique. We've got the auction house, and it's ran by Lloyd the Gyroid, which is open 24 hours a day, where players could put something up for auction, and players and friends uh, connected with the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection could bid on the items. We've got the Shampoodle. The Shampoodle is the city's salon where Harriet can change the player's hairstyle. We've got the Fortune Shop, ran by Katrina, the fortune-telling cat. And she'll tell you your fortune for the day to see how lucky you'll be. And monthly, she'll give you a charm. We've got the Resetti Surveillance Center, which isn't really labeled, but here's a little secret. It's located in the tunnel at the eastern end of the city, and its entrance is usually blocked by two traffic cones. But on random evenings after 8 p.m., a nearby light will be lit, and one of the cones will be pushed to the side, so you're able to get in. We've got Kix the Skunk. He makes his appearance for the first time in the series in City Folk, where you can find him by the auction house on days when it's not raining or snowing, and he'll shine your shoes for 500 bells. And last but not least, we've got Phineas the Sea Lion. He also makes his first appearance in City Folk to give out badges and gifts to players along with balloons, bubble wands, and pinwheels. He's only available in the city on days when the weather is fair, just like Kix. Now, moving on to the fourth game in the mainline series, we've got Animal Crossing New Leaf. Released in Japan on November 8th, 2012, and then throughout the rest of the world through June 2013 on the Nintendo 3DS, and it sold 12.36 million copies. Now, this is the first game in the series where the player takes charge as the mayor. And you go to your town hall, and you have a secretary in the form of a shih tzu named Isabel. And she assists you when planning town projects. And for a price, you could always install benches, bridges, and a whole lot more projects that villagers mention to you. A clock, whatever, you know. You can do that, and you can decorate your town, put things wherever in your town, as you see fit. The graphic style in New Leaf, they changed a bit more. The players and the villagers, they're having more human-like proportions, rather than the shorter, stumpy ones in past games, and as well as the trees, the flowers, and the houses looking a lot more realistic. In New Leaf, for a thousand bells, you can visit Tortimer Island in the ocean south of your town. And in the Welcome Center on the island, you're able to play mini-games called Tours, where some of the games consist of hide-and-seek, scavenger hunts, fishing, bug catching, shooting down balloons with a slingshot, and a whole lot more. And then when you're outside of the Welcome Center, where you're at the island, you could use all these rented tools like an axe, a shovel, a bug net, a fishing rod, or a wetsuit, and you could catch exotic bugs and fish that you just can't get in your town and sell them for a whole lot more money. Uh, there are new fossils, insects, and fruits, such as bananas and lemons, introduced into the game. And at the beginning of the game, while they're waiting on the train to head into town, they could pick the town layout, rather it being a random map, like in previous games. The outside of your house can now be customized to your liking. Certain pieces of furniture can now be placed onto walls. Uh, the player can now go swimming in the ocean and dive for coral and deep sea creatures. A new tool, the megaphone, can be used to get a villager's attention and their location. Villagers are even more active in the town where they're capable of fishing, shaking trees, entering buildings, and so on and so forth. You can now choose where you want your house. And man! There was just a lot more extra locations put into this game. There was a lot of love put into New Leaf, I gotta say. So, combining it with the Welcome Amiibo edition that came out in 2016, there was a campsite to buy exclusive items from a van. Kind of shady, but yeah, I, I've done it plenty of times. It's fine, it's safe. 
We have The Roost, which is now a standalone coffee shop now ran by Brewster the Pigeon. We have Retail, which is ran by a couple, Reese and Cyrus. They're all packas, where you can buy and sell items as well as customize your furniture. Uh, we have the Happy Home Showcase, where you can visit homes of people you connect through through Street Pass, and you can order the furniture you see in their homes from a catalog. We have Nook's Homes. It's a shop where you can change the outside look of your home. Then we have Kicks. Yeah, the Kicks from City Folk. He has his own shop now, and you can buy shoes and socks. We have the Garden Center, a shop that sells flower seeds and tree saplings, which is run by a sloth named Leaf. We got Shampoodle, but it's located upstairs above the Able Sisters, offering hair and eye color styling. Inside the museum in the top floor, there is a shop run by Celeste. We got Club LOL, which is a club run by KK Slider and Dr. Shrunk, where KK Slider works daily as a DJ, and he still holds his traditional performances on Saturday nights, as always, you got to. There's a photo booth where, you know, you can get your picture taken and uh, whatever picture you have will appear on your town pass card. And last but not least, a new addition, we've got the Dream Suite, which is run by Luna. And it allows players to visit other towns by inputting that town's dream address. And the visit is set in the dream world, so you can't alter their town at all. But it's a neat little addition. So that's New Leaf. Moving on to Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer. It was released for the Nintendo 3DS in Japan on June 30th, 2015. And it was released on September 25th, 2015 in North America. And it sold 3.04 million copies. It was a side game away from the main series where players had to decorate villager homes and hoping they did a good score, hoping they decorated it right so... Yeah, they, they can move on to the next level and not be a complete failure. But there was a big improvement with the Animal Crossing series that came with this game, where it was the first time where the player could set their skin tone to their liking as well as their hair and their eyes. And some physical versions of Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer came bundled with an NFC reader accessory for the players to scan their amiibo figures into the game. So uh, that is Happy Home Designer. Moving on, we've got Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, which was released for the Wii U in November 2015 worldwide. And to this day, it sold 500,000 copies. This game was pretty bare bones. It was a board game. It had a few mini games, but didn't really push the Animal Crossing series forward. Had a few amiibo figures going with the game, and that was about it, sadly. Then we got Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Kind of want to write this game off because it's not like, I don't feel like a mobile game is a legit entry into the series, but um, it came out in 2017 for iOS and Android, and it introduced a few new locations like OK Motors and Gulliver's Ship. Uh, the birds Giovanni, Beppe, and Carlo are new characters into the series. They work at OK Motors, where OK Motors allows players to customize their camper. And uh, yeah, that, that's about it I got for Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. And so, looking forward now, broadening our horizons, we've got Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Nintendo Switch. And since this game is freshly new, don't have much I could tell you besides this. So Tom Nook, he has a new business venture where he's selling a deserted island getaway package where the player is on a nearly deserted island and needs to collect resources to build up the island into what the player seems fit. Me, I want to try to make this into a huge town, just massive. So the new tools in this game are a pole where you can vault over rivers and also a ladder to climb up cliffs. So that really does save a lot of time, I would think. You could also pave roads and you also get a Nook phone, which has all kinds of apps and goals to achieve to be able to buy items that will help you out. And yeah, that's just the beginning. So Animal Crossing New Horizons released March. 20th, 2020, worldwide on the Nintendo Switch. That's where we leave off with the series. 
So, now. Next up, we've got some Animal Crossing fun facts. Do you like fun facts? I like fun facts. All right. Fun facts coming up next. I love it. I listen to it all the time. Industrial Industries World Radio. Yeah, best radio station ever. Yeah, good as always, sweetie. (laughs) What do you think, sweetie? All right, guys, settle down. This is serious matters now because I've got Animal Crossing fun facts. So here we go. Number one. Like the Japanese release, Animal Crossing was going to be called Animal Forest, but its name was eventually changed, and it takes inspiration from the Animal Crossing road signs to warn of large animals who would cross the road. Number 2. In Animal Crossing New Leaf, if you start a new save file on April Fool's Day, Balanca will appear on the train instead of Rover. Balanca is a white cat that has no face, and she asks you to draw a face for her. Number three, you would have been able to pan for gold in New Leaf, but the idea was scrapped. Number four, Mr. Rossetti the Mole scared a lot of younger female players to the point of tears. When you don't save your game before turning it off, Mr. Rossetti digs a hole as you go outside of your home to scream at you for not saving your game. These long speeches he gives are entertaining and at times purposely long to give you a harsh reminder to save your game. In interviews, Nintendo employees said, Some people love him, of course, but there are others who don't like being shouted at in his rough accent. It seems like younger female players, in particular, are scared. I've heard that some of them have even cried. End quote. To make things less scary in Animal Crossing New Leaf, Rossetti only appears if you have first built the Reset Surveillance Center, or if you purposely don't save. Number 5. K.K. Slider is based on the game's actual music composer, Kazumi Totaka. Totaka is known for slipping in a simple 19-note melody in almost every game he's helped work on. This melody is known as Totaka's Song, and Animal Crossing is no exception. It's one of three hidden songs in Animal Crossing that K.K. Slider plays. You could hear K.K. play it by requesting K.K. Song. The other two secret songs you'll only hear and get the air checks from by requesting them by name are I Love You and Two Days Ago. Number 6. Isabel, the secretary in New Leaf, is referred to as Shizu in Japan, based on the type of dog she is, a Shih Tzu. Number 7. On Sundays and Mondays at 3.33 a.m. in Animal Crossing New Leaf, Players can watch an alien message on their television sets. The bizarre message will replace the static on your television set until 3.34 a.m., when your television will return to its original static. Number 8. Katsuya Iguchi's favorite animal is the cat. So that's why most of the animals in Animal Crossing are cats. Number 9. If you watch TV early in the morning, you may see a short exercise program. This is a real exercise program that is shown every morning in Japan called Raijo Taisu, or Radio Exercise. Number 10. Super Tortimer is a prank NES game received by Tortimer on April Fool's Day in Animal Crossing. Contrast to the other NES games, Super Tortimer is unplayable, and an attempt to play it leads to a voice bubble stating that Super Tortimer isn't an NES game. Number 11. In the game, Cap'n sometimes talks about cucumbers. This is because Cap'n is a Kappa from Japanese folklore. Kappas are seen as very mischievous creatures, but if you give them a cucumber, they are said to leave you alone. And number 12. Sahara and Gracie in the Japanese version of Animal Crossing games are actually very flamboyant males instead of females in the North American and European versions of Animal Crossing games. And those are your Animal Crossing fun facts. Hey, yo, so we're about to wrap up this show, but before I leave you, I got to tell you about my experience with Animal Crossing. 
You know, back in the day, I was at Kmart. I remember this very vividly. I walked up to this counter, this like, uh, you know, customer service counter, and they had all these DVDs, and it was like, the future is here or something. It was in this like cardboard sleeve, and it was like for the GameCube, the Nintendo GameCube. And I was like, I don't have a DVD player or whatever, but like, oh, maybe my computer at home, like my parents' family computer. So I went home and I put this DVD in there. And one of the commercials, like promo stuff they had on this DVD, was this live action Animal Crossing thing set to look like a reality TV show. Like these were like commercials to like kind of sell the game or whatever. And I was like, oh, that's kind of different, kind of neat. I still had, like, no idea what it was about. Like, the commercials were kind of useless at the time. But looking back on it, it's cool, you know, to see, like, the characters in live action, kind of. A little later on, I saw it released on the GameCube. And I was looking at it, and I saw more commercials on TV, where it was, like, more and more gameplay. And I was like, oh, okay, so you could just kind of live life however you want to live life okay i'm getting i'm reading the reviews and reading things about it and getting more in depth to the point where it was like on my mind like i gotta get animal crossing for the gamecube and i finally saw it on sale at this shop you know used game store for 44 bucks or something i buy it and that was my dumb regret i should have just bought it brand new because the person who bought it prior got this present that came with the memory card. So the game came with a memory card and it had like two NES games pre-programmed on it. So me being stupid and not knowing that, buying it second hand, the person who bought it brand new got those games and, you know, deleted their town on there. So it was like no way I could get that, like... Needless to say, I played Animal Crossing and I loved it. I fell in love with it the first time I, you know, it consumed me, consumed my life. I took it over to my friend Jake's house and he got into it. So we had towns together and we would, you know, share like designs and stuff we made. And God, it was so fun. I remember I was in high school. This was like late 2002. And I would be washing dishes at the time at one of these grease ball restaurants that ain't around anymore. And um, I would just be like, man, it's 11 o'clock. I hope I can get out of here before then and get home before it uh, turns midnight so I could talk to K.K. Slider and get another song to put in my radio, you know. Those were the days, man. I tell you what, those were the days. Yeah, my uh, relationship with Animal Crossing was from the start, at least here in America, when it came to GameCube. I was on it at the very, very beginning. After that, I didn't get into Wild World because I didn't have a Nintendo DS. And around the time like that was going out, I was working as a radio DJ and I had uh, no money. So, uh, you know, I, I, me buying a video game around that time was like insanity to me. Or regardless, even a new system, you know. But I wound up buying a Wii later on when it came out and bought City Folk. And I played it for a little bit, but I just got distracted with the whole nunchuck and remote thing. And I just didn't really like it. Even if you could play it with the Pro Controller, I, I, I didn't get the hang of it. But, I mean, I still got it. I should just probably pull it out and play it some more. But uh, 3DS was out and I knew New Leaf was coming out. And I was, uh, you know, this was the age of YouTube now being established and you could, you know see what's really popping off and watching the game as it was getting developed and new updates and all that. So me, Paul, Mark, Jake, my brother, like all these people, we were all ready. So it was like a, you know, team effort. We all got our games and we'd be playing and visiting each other. And man, it was just a party when New Leaf hit. That's all I could say. And New Horizons, I got to say, it's going to be a whole lot of partying, a lot bigger party. But yeah. So yeah, that is my experience with Animal Crossing. Let's get out of here.
as this episode of Industrial Industries World Radio does come to a close, I want to say I hope you learned something about Animal Crossing, at least a little bit. I mean, some of you may be know-it-alls and you you scan the internets all day just about video games, but uh, yeah, this was a very deep, deep uh, rabbit hole I went through, and I learned a lot. I hope you guys learned a lot too. Got some fun facts in there, and uh, you're psyched for New Horizons, the new game. It's dropping Friday. I hope you're excited. I am excited. And oh yeah, let me just check just for the podcast's sake. Yes, yes, yes. So there are three days left until the release of Animal Crossing New Horizons for the Nintendo Switch. So we're right there, guys. Hang in with me. Hang in, we'll get there. <sighs> I'd like to thank Kimmy Pops for voiceover work, Giuliano for graphic design, and I'd also like to thank you for listening. Rating five stars, telling everybody about how awesome this show is, and everything else that you do. This was episode 22 of Industrial Industries World Radio. I am DJ Glowing Ice, and I will see you next week for another fun-filled episode of Industrial Industries World Radio. And until then, have a great week. Enjoy playing the new Animal Crossing game, and I will see you next week, guys. Have a great rest of your day, rest of your week. I'm out of here. I'll see you next week. All right, peace out. next time on Industrial Industries World Radio.